Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another round of Rock the Block Live. <laughs> you know, we talk about um, blockchain these days, right? And you can't move away from blockchain without talking about ICOs. Even though a lot of people, especially the institutional investors and people who are really in the tech field, want to divorce blockchain with cryptocurrency for good reasons. Because mm. we talk about cryptocurrency, you talk about speculation, uh, people playing the market, but at the same time, the blockchain technology itself is where the future really is. But the mainstream audience don't care. They want to know how to make the money. Founders of various uh, technological ideas want to raise funds. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, most people are still going to look at fundraising as a key topic when they look at blockchain. Yep. So you're not in blockchain previously. What were you doing all along? So I have a very uh, unique career path, right? Uh, I was trained as an engineer, went through the uh, polytechnic route, uh, never got to practice engineering, then um, decided to do a PhD. So I did, I did more academic research in uh, engineering as well. Um, came back to Singapore um, and then decided to join a venture capital fund. So that's when I hopped onto the dark side of uh, <laughs> finance and investing. Yeah. Uh, did venture capital investing for about eight years and then uh, you know decided to join a bank right so I was with the bank for a couple of years um, and I had something to do with uh, fin uh, alternative financing uh, not ICOs mm. not blockchain uh, but something called uh, venture debt nah. so it's, it's I mean in a nutshell venture debt financing is basically targeted uh, at loans for uh, companies to raise uh, working capital mm. Mm. so we have heard a lot about a VC and how VCs can be a real shock. Yeah. Uh, this is before blockchain in a traditional market where VCs will come in and take a large chunk out of a, out of business. Mm. Now, for most of us in this scene, uh, we may not be familiar with finance uh, until we perhaps got into cryptocurrency. Then we started getting more mm. savvy about it. Right. Uh, would you give, care to give us an insight into the world of uh, venture capitalism? Sure. I mean, I, I came from that side, right? Um, I started, uh, you know, right from the ground up. Uh, to learn about the whole world of venture investing. Mm. Um, and I have to say, right, for innovation, uh, venture capital is a must, mm. right? Um, they do take a lot, large chunk of your company, but you have to think about the other uh, angle, right? And the other angle is that the venture capitalists are actually taking a huge risk, okay? Funding innovation, um, I guess the ratio of failure is about probably 80 to 90%, yeah. right? If you had a seed or early stage companies, uh, you know, one or two out of, out of ten companies is only going to succeed. Mm -hmm. right? the, eight or, the eight or nine of them is going to fail. Right? Well, what's, what's that thought about when you take too much out? Understand the risk because if eight out of ten fail, mm. the remaining yeah. two will have to make up for the, the loss, right? Correct. But when you take so much out of a project, wouldn't that kill the, the motivation for the founder to create and work for it? Well, um, that's where, that's where my, my experience in Silicon Valley, I think, helps a lot now. Okay. Um, and I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs actually failing once, not just once, right, but twice, three times. And <laughs> with every failure, right, actually the path to success is actually nearer. Mm. Right? If you get to a success the first time around, uh, you, you, don't, you don't learn the hard way. Yeah. Right? So if you fail once, you fail twice, the third time you're going you're gonna to succeed. Or so even you, then. So you will be looking at project founders who have sort of paid their dues, gone through multiple iterations yeah. and then come back to you and those are the guys that you One, think that 100% right? right so we look at uh, entrepreneurs who are either had a taste of failure or had a taste of success right uh, these are what we call serial entrepreneurs mm. so the definition of serial entrepreneurs doesn't mean that they have to sell the company three times now but it could mean that they failed three times mm. yeah. some people say that being an entrepreneur requires a certain level of sadism because it is, <laughs> <laughs> it is extremely painful, the grind to be an entrepreneur. It's, it, I'm, sorry, I'm a serial entrepreneur myself and I have gotten uh, my fair share of being burnt. Uh, not, sometimes not even because the business failed, mm. but because of the lack of knowledge and learning how to deal with people who are there to sort of manipulate you. So sometimes yeah. it's a people issue, sometimes it's a business issue. There's so many ways and things that can go wrong in an entrepreneur's life. 100%. Compared yeah. to say, if you work in a, a, a bank, for example, you have a 9 to 5 stable income, stable job with perks and everything. At the same time, you have an entire ecosystem and an infrastructure to support you. And you can just, it's very hard to go wrong, exactly. especially in a bank, yeah. I would say. Yeah. 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 So I guess, uh, yes, you know, the, the path of an entrepreneur is very, very tough. 
uh, you know, people put in long hours. Entrepreneurs put in about maybe on average about fifteen to you know eighteen, sometimes even twenty four hours. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking know, about a day, right? A day. <laughs> yeah. A day. So on average, twenty four seven, you have to be available, right? Yeah. Uh, you're running a company, even there's only ten people. Yeah. Uh, but a startup company, you got to assume every rule, right? You got to be the finance, you got to be the legal. Yeah. Uh, you got to do sales, and then you got to run the company as well. So it's it's tough. It's tough multitasking. And we are seeing this sort of leadership rising up in the blockchain community because uh, when we talk about like you know being a multitasker, being a, mm. a, 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 a an army of one, you are the CEO and founder on your name card, but you are also the janitor back in your if you even have an office, yep, right? Yep, yep. And the people are saying that ICO is killing the VC uh, circuit. Is that true? Do you feel the impact? Is that killing you guys? Uh, not, not, not really. Like I guess uh, there are two two schools of thought, right? I think one um, ICOs are making liquidity uh, a lot more available yeah. to many different uh, projects that would otherwise uh, not be funded. I mean, just to to give you a context, right? The venture capital uh, community, the funds, right? Don't fund probably about ten to twenty percent of all the innovation here, right? So there's another seventy or eighty percent out there that's left hanging in the air. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for a good thing, ICOs are funding that. For a bad thing, I guess uh, a lot of these uh, projects are funded on ideas, lah. Yeah. Right? On a dream, right? The white paper, the white paper projects. The white trying to find the next unicorn. Syndrome, yeah. <laughs> Have you invested in any projects in uh, the last few years? I mean, personally, yes. Uh, so I've done uh, two angel investments in early stage companies. Mm. One is a hardware company. Uh, one is a software company. Okay. Uh, but. Across my span of uh, say 14, 15 years of uh, venture investment, okay. I've done probably about 20, 30 investments. Okay. All in all. Yeah. And that's that's where you figure out 80 to 90 percent are failures. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it depends on where which stage you play at, right? So there are very early stage companies that fund say a hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars yeah. in the top, and those are where the 80, 90 percent failure rates are. Okay. And then as you go later down the series of uh, uh, investing. Then the success rate gets a bit better uh, with every yeah. stage of the But then, of course, you get lesser or so out of it. It's lesser yeah. risk, le- yeah. lesser yeah. return. That's the name of the game. And what are the things that you are looking out for as an investor? Well, I guess uh, you, you want to look out for two things, right? You want to look out for, for of course, the entrepreneur. Uh, you want to look out for a business model that makes sense. You know, there are, there are business models that fund based on, uh, you know, giving consumers a lot of. Uh, uh, good bargains and promo codes, mm. and those are very heavily invested. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, you have to look at the team as well, right? Uh, who is running the team? Who is executing the idea? Mm. And who is investing, right? So typically, um, I would find a young uh, entrepreneur, but he has to have a very good uh, mentor behind him, and I'm ready to step up as a mentor if he needs one. Okay. Now, in some of my videos, if you guys might have, uh, if you, you have been following my videos, you have seen me talking about how when a project is heavily backed by institutional investors or pure VC investment with very little room for retail investors to come in mm. avoid those projects right uh, <laughs> because personally I, f- I felt that over the l- last few months a lot of projects that were backed very heavy by private investors what they want to do is when it gets the projects get listed there's no lock-in period for them mm. they start to dump and then we see a price drop um, okay. What's your take on that statement? Well, I guess there's a reason why uh, venture capital funds are set up that way, right? Um, you know, it's not like venture capitalism has been around just for one decade or two decades, right? If you look at it back into the history of uh, where venture capital started from, you know, from the, from the US or even from Europe, it's been around for uh, decades and they have been funding, you know, companies, large companies, right? Like Apple, mm. Applied Materials, you know, uh, Genentech for that reason. And today they are large, large uh, multinational corporations, right? Uh, you know, churning out billions of dollars of uh, revenue. So, you know, venture capital funds are, uh, are also regulated. So it means that, you know, when whatever they do is also being scrutinized. Uh, but what they bring to the table is really not just the capital, right? It's also a sense of uh, uh, corporate governance, mm. uh, Actually, a sense it, of mentoring as it well. It gives people the confidence that this project is legit, yes. VCs are backing it up, we will be safe, yeah. safer to go yeah, in. That's, that's one way of putting it. Yeah. So we talk about VCs, we obviously know about ICOs, I'm not even going to bore you guys about ICOs. Mm. Uh, now we talk about alternative 
uh, what, no, sorry, venture debt. Mm. And I come from the old school school of thought where debt equals bad thing. Mm. Never get to debt, right? My my grandma would say, you would rather save your money inside a Kong Guan Tin can and use what you can afford to pay yeah. for, and to get into debt. So what is this venture debt about? It sounds quite new to me. Well, I guess I have to dispel the myth that debt is bad, right? I mean, debt if you use it in a in a very uh, proper manner, it's, it's it's actually can help you a lot. Right? So personally, if you buy a house, you take on a mortgage, right? That's yeah. debt. Yeah. Okay, but you buy what you can afford, right? Same same for the venture capital world as well. Mm. Uh, in the venture capital world, financing come in a couple of uh, uh, buckets. Uh. So equity is more more common, and and typically people know it by the term venture capital. But venture capital also includes venture debt, right? And debt financing, uh, it's the same as taking a loan from a bank. But just that, you know, if you if you are a startup company, uh, you don't have any established track record. Yeah. You walk into the bank, they will probably won't fund you, lah. Yeah. So that's where venture debt funds are, are you know, established to help uh, startup companies to raise uh, working capital loans, mm-hmm. working capital in the form of a loan. Okay. Yeah. From from the sound of it, this is like pretty high risk for you because you would lend the money to the startup the founder as a startup loan yeah. and if the business tank what do you get out of it do you have does he have to pay you back because in the case of the bank he will have to pay back or be declared bankrupt right is that the same as well well it's pretty much the same right uh, except the fact that venture debt funds actually go for little little stage companies uh, companies with proven product uh, companies that have already some established revenue. I mean, it could be a million dollars, it could be $10 million. We have funded companies that are in the hundreds of millions of revenues, right? So it, it differs. Uh, but you're right, there are risks. Uh, the risk is, is pretty high. Um, but you don't see, you know, every single startup companies raising debt. Yeah. So only, only companies that are, are deemed to have qualified to raise uh, a debt we will give them uh, venture loans. That sounds even harder to get than say a venture uh, capital investment because you need to, you mentioned one million dollar revenue. That doesn't sound like a startup company to me. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a company that's well on its way to get a next round of funding for growth, right? Yeah. So there is still that level barrier to entry. So you guys listening to this, don't just jump into it thinking, hey, I don't have to give out equity. Why don't I just take that and yeah. you know, give, take a loan out of it? And how does that work? So assuming that the, uh, the company qualifies, mm-hmm. right? It has an MVP. I talked about it all the time. It has a solid team. The founder has paid his dues. You look at him, this guy has some backing. Maybe he has a mentorship. If he doesn't have a mentorship, this is where you can step in. Yep. At the same time, his business plan has, has some traction, it's sound, uh, he has some user acquisition already using his, his beta product. So that seems to have like a checklist and it takes up on all the, yeah. the go, good to go. Yeah. And then how does it work now? He comes to you, you go to him, what's the conversation going to be like? So typically, um, we work very closely with the VCs. Yeah. Right? The VCs have invested in the company. Um, they put in one or two rounds of financing um, and they're ready to take up a portion of debt, right? to kind of offset the financing needs. Uh. Right, so for example, um, companies raise Series A, you know, $5 million. Traditionally, $5 million would be, have to be raised out of uh, equity. You give up 20% of the company, right? For venture debt, uh, we come in together with the VCs. So they fund $4 million or they fund $3 million of equity. And then we come, we, we, we make up the rest with debt. Mm. But because debt, uh, you, 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 you give out less of the company, right? So yeah. the dilutive nature of the debt on the company is a lot less. Okay. But of course, uh, but debt has to be repaid. Yeah, yeah, debt has to be repaid, which is why companies in the later stage uh, of development are more suited for debt. Mm-hmm. Because they, are, they have the revenue to actually pay back the debt. Well, uh, yes and no, right? So uh, uh, venture debt also assumes that the company runs out of money at a certain point in time oh, before okay. the debt is fully repaid. Okay. Right, so there is a risk that we are yeah. taking up inherently. La. So between the bank and you guys, uh, mm. in this case, I would assume that the, the, the deal with you guys will be sweeter than the bank. Uh, well, not, not exactly true because the banks don't really do it, right? Okay. So, so there's but not, would it, not, the banks not, do give no out like a capital yeah, exactly. loan and like business loans or so, right? Well, those are more for SMEs, okay. right? Uh, and those, those guys have track records of like five, seven, eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the, com- the company is already on its way, right? Uh, but you, when you look at the growth nature of these companies, yeah. 
they tend to be in the maybe single digit to teens, right? Yeah. Whereas the startup companies are exploding in terms of growth, lah. So yeah. exponentially, you know. Like you could be a three year startup, but you make like a lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so there there is a difference there, right? And mm. and more importantly, the companies that we fund yeah. are loss making. Ah. Yeah. So they're still loss making in nature, right? Okay. Okay. Whereas the banks would typically will fund most of the companies that are profit making. See, but they're loss making in terms like Uber is a loss maker because they're trying to expand. Yep. But it's not exactly I'm bleeding. <laughs> I'm yep. bleeding from bad business model, right? Yep. So Ooh. a lot of companies, I think startups uh, in particular, they choose to stay on the loss making track, right? Because they need to continuously innovate. Speed is fast. They need speed is more important. Yeah. Right? They want to get a bigger market share, you know, they want to take on other things, they acquire a company, they take on more debt, they take yeah. on more equity as well, and then they become a unified platform for everybody. Like. Yeah. Sounds familiar, That right? is the ICO game! <laughs> it was to be a protocol and a platform. There is a race right now uh, to be that one answer to everybody out there in the market to use. Uh, you know, like we talk about supply chain, we talk about any other thing that you can have in mind, Right now, the current race is to be the top layer protocol, top tier. And you also, what was interesting for me was, I just learned that right before we went into recording, you mentioned that you were thinking of putting venture debt model onto the blockchain. Mm. Now, I, I, I'm a blockchain guy, so I'm very curious about how that's going to work. Well, I guess, uh, like, like we, we, we exchanged, exchanged a couple of uh, uh, info points, right? Um, the blockchain is a distributed ledger. Mm. So the idea is that you know everything that's finance related can be recorded on a ledger, mm. but what you want is to be able to authenticate and, and audit the trails of the the transactions, right? So you know it's no different from being like a bank, just that you know it's just used for venture debt financing. So instead of having a central database with your team of accountant and the finance department going through the checklist, making potentially some mistakes here and there, doing yeah. a follow up, taking three days to three weeks to get certain processes cleared. Everything is automated, everything is on the blockchain, it's transparent, it's almost peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't even have to be a public blockchain, it can even be a private blockchain in this case. 100%. Wow, see? There's a use case right there. Not everything has to be, I'm assuming it's not ICO, right? No, no. <laughs> not it's everything. It's a legitimate <laughs> blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this, this is very interesting for me and uh, where is it starting out from? This is going to be, are you like the main man in Asia for people to come to? Well, there, there are a couple of uh, competitors, right? So I used to work for a bank um, and I started the venture debt financing for them. Uh, decided to leave corporate and, and come out and start my own venture debt fund. Nice. So that's, that's still work in the progress. There'll be a couple of news coming out, so stay in tune. Now, I, I want to get some information on that because as far as I'm concerned, Jeremy, uh, you are evil incarnate. First, you're a VC and then you're a banker. You are yeah. you're like everything that the blockchain early <laughs> pioneers kind of want to work around, you know, like banker, ooh, right? So, but, but now we kind of have a nice, very, uh, we're drinking beer here on a, on a Monday afternoon. Um, why do you want to leave banking? Like, you could do this in a bank, right? I would assume. Why do you have to do this on your own? It sounds a lot tougher. Well, it's not, not just a bank. I guess in, in any corporate, it's the same, right? Yeah. There's a lot of uh, restricted, uh, you know, uh, rate tapes around and, oh, and things don't move fast enough. Uh. So, I mean, I, I have nothing against what the bank or the corporate is doing. Yeah. It's just that I, I felt that things can be done a lot more faster. Like, so this, this sounds like something potentially juicy out of it. Like, you know, you're holding back, Jeremy. <laughs> you, you, you got to be pissed off to a certain level to want to leave and start your own. I come from that realm. I come from the realm of starting stuff on my own, grinding through shit because I have a point to make. Yeah. So no one just leaves and start their own business and to win and fence. If you did that, I'll be worried for your business because yeah. I'm going to ask how long it's going to sustain. But it has got to have a stronger motivation. I want to find that motivation in you. Like, what's that driving you, Jeremy? Well, to be, to be honest, I think um, I've learned a lot, right? Oh. From, from being within a regulated environment. Yeah. Uh, but like I say, corporate, you know, you have to deal with the bosses, you have to deal with the employees, you got to deal with all the, you know, regulation and everything else. Like. So, there's nothing wrong. I mean, you learn how to do things properly. Um, you know, you get tied to a leash. And then, all of a sudden, you just felt that you want to be able to unleash yourself. Yeah. So, and I would assume that even if the bosses love the idea, they themselves have their, their hands tied. Yeah. Because protocol as, it's, uh, as it is. 100%. Yeah. They will tell you like, you know what, I love the idea, but sorry. <laughs> that didn't come from me, that came from him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would assume that how that would work, right? 
um, because we have friends in, 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 in corporations, high flyers, even even the guys who are signing off mm. on documents, they tell me that, you know, this is protocol. And and that is just the nature of the beast. And I'm so happy that you have this great idea. And when you are funding entrepreneurs and you're working with them, did that rub off with you in some way that gave you the balls to just go out there and do things? Because it takes a lot yeah. for someone to quit a cushy job mm. to do something that would be brand new. Yeah. So I guess you're right in that sense, right? So I've uh, been funding entrepreneurs, been looking at startup companies uh, fail and, and some of them succeed as well. So in some ways, uh, you know, that kind of etched me on to be an entrepreneur myself. Lah. So right now I'm out there. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I can, I can, I can definitely succeed. So now I want to give this. Good luck. <laughs> of course, Jeremy. Good luck for that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you your own advice now. So you are, this is your first. Uh, I was looking at what you just mentioned. This will be your first startup, startup. Yeah. And taking your own advice about looking at founders who have failed multiple times before they are legit. Yeah. You, are you prepared for that? Like. One one hundred percent, right? So I've I've been in a situation where I have to deal with failure, not yeah. not of my own. Yeah, okay. But then the failure is uh, not easy to take on, right? I mean, you got you're dealing with the livelihoods of a bunch of people, mm. right? And when the company goes down, you got to deal with oh, it. Of so I I'm in that same situation whether I'm an investor or I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. So I guess I guess from that respect, I have like six times of uh, yeah. experience, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, so so you, you you have that that backing, right? Your experience and yeah. you've seen enough. You've done. You've you've paid your dues through other people's experiences and being so close, even as a mentor level. Yep. That has got to be very personal. It, it is. It your is. failure is your failure. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Now before we end off uh, the the this discussion, I will just move away from uh, financing for a bit and let's talk about emerging technology mm. in in the field because uh, I know you're not a blockchain guy you're a traditional guy uh, dabbling to the blockchain but not really in the ICO world so I'll look at the blockchain angle the tech angle mm. emerging technologies and how does blockchain help help this out like because you were in VC for a long time and you have seen projects gone through many iterations and then probably in your mind I'm guessing hey now that blockchain tech is out there the other five projects that didn't make it before have a better chance now yeah and we look to beyond 2018 and 2019, what are some of the emerging technology that could benefit from blockchain? Well, I, I guess, you know, my brush with uh, blockchain and crypto and then ICOs, right? Um, I've seen them trying to rub off what a, a traditional financial institution wants to do, right? Um, I'm not an expert, but I felt I feel that the, the ledger business is the one to go for, mm. You know, whether is it trade finance, uh, you know, whether is it peer to peer lending. Um, you know, uh, recently I mentored a, a company that is trying to uh, use blockchain to revolutionize uh, peer to peer lending, right? Okay. So instead of just raising, you know, uh, like a Kickstarter project, money goes in, there's no accountability. Uh. The whole process is actually being regulated. So from where the funders are to where the companies are, everything is all out there in transparency. So regulated by, by regulation in that case, in that sense, you mean smart contract, using the smart contract and tech to regulate? In a way, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, let's uh, imagine, right? Uh, a white paper company raises $100 million. I mean, why should you give them $100 million right from the start? Right? You can trickle it down, you know, a million dollars here and there. And then as the company progresses and achieves its uh, goal, yeah. then the money gets tranched out. Right? Now, that is freaking logical, and that's a question I've been asking yep. ever since the first white paper was, was produced uh, sometime last year. Like when everyone's throwing money into, I think, Tezos or two, raise 200 million, 300 million, mm. 80 million. These are numbers that I've never seen before on a private round funding or even public funding on just an idea. Like, look, I have lots of ideas. If I can even raise $80,000, Big deal. And these are companies raising 80 million just on a promise. So some things have got to change, but people didn't really, they didn't continue. Why people don't really ask the question? Well, I guess everybody wants to fund innovation, right? Uh, and then going back to the theme about venture capital funds, um, there are, these are huge ticket size investment, right? Mm. So if you want to invest in the fund as an individual, you can, but you probably have to put in half a million or one million dollars, yeah. right? But here, you can fund an innovation, you probably fund $10,000, $5,000, or some even a $100 ticket, right? And people don't really blink an eye when yeah. it's a small sum. Yeah. 
right? But if you put a uh, hundred dollars and you know, I mean, like they say, right? If you collect a dollar from from everybody in China, you have <laughs> one and a half billion dollars, right? Yeah. So that's the whole concept of, and, and of you, bite-sized you, investments. Right. And if you tank at a one point four five billion dollar company, and everyone has just put in a hundred dollars. No one is going to call pay so much because mm. just oh, hundred dollars gone. There's very little accountability now, no, so no, I think no. that's that's that has to change. So that's I think that is changing right now. If mm. you look at it, like I've not seen a lot of ICOs these days uh, don't get to raise that kind of money anymore. Firstly, people's going to ask where's your MVP. Mm. You're going to see some beta going on. Now, w- about about your advisory and your mentorship, how is that like? Because I, mm. either fortunately or unfortunately. I don't have a mentor. Like everything that I learned and done in business was from failure for myself. And I do wish at times where if someone could be there behind me to sort of kick my ass and tell me, "Hey, look, obvious pitfall." At the same time, I'm not sure whether my stubborn nature would accept mentorship. At the same time, you yeah. know, uh, I mean, I'm 20. When I was 25, and when I'm 35, is very different in the mindset. At 25, I think, "No, my idea rocks. It's the mm-hmm. best thing. Don't tell me I can't." But at 35, you realize, no. If only I had listened to somebody back then, yeah. I might not have spent 10 years learning all this. Right. So how would mentorship, how would mentoring me be like? Since yeah. you've yeah, you got this half an hour to talk to me, you kind of get a sense of who I am. What would you do for me? No, I guess it's uh, it's not trying to correct somebody and and getting all the mistakes out of the way, right? Yeah. It's about you know taking a a, a bigger leap at a time. Um, you know, you can avoid some of the mistakes, but it's good to have them make mistakes as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so even as a mentor, you know, I would encourage them to think freely on their own. Uh, but you know, you come back to me for advice, huh? But I don't want to kind of stuff the creative yeah. nature, right? If you start feeding people, then uh, you know, you become like the Singapore kind of environment spoon where feed everybody everything. Yeah, 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 this is a ten year series of failures for entrepreneurship. <laughs> you go study, and you're gonna be better. For- Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. You know what? I I enjoyed this conversation with you. In fact, I learned a lot of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I may call you up and uh, check out on how I your business is doing. Let me know. Keep yeah. Me up once once we announce the fund, I think you'll be the first one to know. Awesome, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jeremy Low. For more information about him, if you want to find out how to get in touch with him, I'm not going to give his number on this on this video, but get in touch with us. We'll kind of hook you up if we think you're suitable for this, right? Well, my name is Eugene Tay. You're watching Rock the Block Live. Signing up. See you guys.